turn this over to I will turn this over to Nitin Bhai and Pallav Rajiv. They're going to talk about similarity between spider's web and the creation we dwell in. So with that being said, Pallav Rajiv and Nitin Bhai, are you there? Yes, yes, we are. Thank you, Sunilji. Thank you, Madanji, for such an awesome session. Thank you um, and welcome. Good morning, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita session. Radhe Radhe, Nitinji, over to you. Radhe Radhe Pallaviji, thank you. Good morning, good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita session. And thank you, Sunil Bhai and Madanji, for a wonderful session, like always. So, um, today we'll pick up the next shloka, 4.24. 4.24. Uh, it is also called a food shloka. Uh, we will do the tilling of the ground today for that shloka uh, because that concept is fairly deep and can often be confusing. So we will see how far we can go there. It might require a couple of sessions to really get into the depth or the skin of that particular shloka. Um, so let me share my screen and we'll get started with our opening prayers. Again, a very warm welcome to all of you. All right, I'm sharing my screen. Are you able to see it? Audio video looks fine, Pallaviji? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Great. So let's get started um, by invoking the blessings of Guru and God. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Ishwarha. Guru Sakshat Parabrahma Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanur Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Gurum Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru. Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening again, all of you. So, let's get started. I said we are going to do 4.24 today. I'll recite it and then you are welcome to follow along. Brahma Arpanam Brahma Haver. Brahmagno Brahmana Hutam Brahmaivatena Gantavyam Brahma Karma Samadhina. All right, we have a new participant, Pavaniji. Yes, Radhe Radhe, Pavaniji. Radhe Pavaniji, please go ahead. Please go ahead, yes. Uh, Radhe Radhe Prabhu. And this is my granddaughter's name. Uh, she, she might have renamed, or I would, I would have to rename. Go ahead, please. Brahma Pranam Brahma Havir Brahma Gnu Brahmana Mahutam Brahma Vatena Gantavyam Brahma Karma Samadhana Radha Radha. Thank you, Sir because you're doing it with a different name, you are in the running for Best Debut Award. Okay, so we'll see. <laughs> That's correct. Thank you very much. All right, let's take uh, more hands. Yes. Uh, Induji, Radhe Radhe, please go ahead. Radhe Radhe, everybody. Brahma Arpanam, Brahma Havir, Brahma Agnau, Brahma Rangatam, Brahme Den Gantavyam, Brahma Karam Samadhina. Thank you very much. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Sandhya Ji, please go ahead. Radhe Radhe. Radhe. Brahma Arpanam Braham Habir. Brahma Agno Brahma Arpanam. Yes. Yes, now go ahead. Go ahead, Sandhya. Brahma Arpanam Braham Habir. Brahma Agno Brahma Nahutam. Brahmai Vati Nikantavyam Braham Karma Samadhina. Very nice. It was almost flawless. So good job, Sandhya. Radhi Radhi Venkatji, please go ahead. 
ಸಮಾಧಿ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಾಗ್ನೌ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ 
ब्रह्मन गंतव्यम ब्रह्मा कर्म समाधिनाथन अर्पणम दिल एंड अदर ऑफरिंग्स ब्रह्म ब्राह्मण अगेन हवी द ऑब्लेशन ब्रह्म ब्राह्मण अग्नौ इन द सैक्रिफिशियल फायर ब्रह्मना by that person hutam offered brahma brahman again eva certainly tain by that gantavyam to be attained brahma brahman karma offering samadhina those completely absorbed in god consciousness short translation for this shloka goes like for those who are completely absorbed in god consciousness the oblation in is brahman the ladle with which it is offered is brahman the act of offering is brahman and the sacrificial fire is also brahman such persons who view everything as god easily attain him okay can get a little confusing so today like i said we are going to do a bit of a tilling of the ground so that when we get to the actual meaning of this shloka it it becomes lot more clearer so let's get started um, on this one all right we will start with some chinese food All right, we see some Chinese food here, and then we have some Italian food here, followed by some American. By the way, there's I don't know there's a genuinely some American cuisine because it's an amalgamation of a lot of other cuisines. But yeah, the macaroni and cheese you can call it as, and of course the Indian food as you all can relate with, right? So that is one row for us. The second one is we see precious stones. then we see the gadgets then we see a luxury car nice car and we see a palatial home beautiful home as well now we see this is the second row for us just to get some thought process going okay so some nice pictures for you we've got some somebody who's really rich and we see somebody who is poor then we see somebody who is famous and then we see somebody who is powerful okay just some pictures i have picked up what is common between all these okay you don't need to think really hard about it because it's completely out of context okay so there is obviously yes somebody raised their hand yeah shri ramya yeah, go ahead yeah i just wanted to answer the question i mean was it for all oh sure go ahead if you want to answer mm-hmm. so i uh, what i wanted to add is the common thing among all this is the variance like there is this variety and and uh, like in mathematical term it's called the uh, variance like uh, how much far away from the mean the distribution is so completely unrelated disjointed sets so to say in mathematics right mutually exclusive absolutely no connection whatsoever what you are talking about right random right all right i'll bring some commonality to it now so chinese food italian food american indian you say where is this food come from you will say my mom prepared it right where did the ingredients come from from the kitchen where did they come from kitchen they came from the market where did they come in the market from obviously from a bigger storehouse where did they come from from the farmers go down where did the farmer get it from from the crops where did, how did the crops come about from the grains where did the grains come from from the soil okay soil you can trace it back you are doing plus minus with the grains that you got out of which you are making chinese you can make indian food it's the grains end of the day and where are the grains coming from they are coming from the soil that is the technology nowhere else so we are doing plus minus with regards to all these things now the precious stones let's talk with about the precious stones part of it uh, diamond diamond is nothing but a carbon piece of coal who could withstand extreme amount of pressure for a sustained amount of time where is it coming from earth again from soil same thing with the gadgets how are the gadgets formed it is silica you extract or other things and then you simply you know do the plus and minus around it form those semiconductor circuits and all that stuff and that is how it is formed brick and mortar is your home and luxury car is again steel or whatever iron it's ferrous everything is coming from earth only right iron and if you look at people here of course people all of them are people there is a difference between 
the objects that we have seen so far in humans, right? Because there is an X factor in humans. But there is a common denominator there as well. All of this thing is coming from mud soil. Okay, that is the common denominator. Of course, humans have soul also, which goes beyond that. But if you think of it, it is nothing but a derivative of mud. All of these things. Nothing else. Derivative of mud. And where is the mud coming from? Does anybody know where is the mud coming from? See, scientists and people, all the great chefs and all the scientists, they can do plus minus with the things which are already available. Can anybody create mud, soil, water, air, sky, these entities? Nobody can. So these things are readily available to us. And then we are doing plus and minus and making things out of it. Okay. Now we will, yes, I can see a couple of hands raised. I'll get into uh, the concept behind it. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, Samji. Radhe, Radhe, please Radhe, Radhe. Um, Earth is uh, one of the uh, inferior energy of God. And I think it is coming from water, right? I mean, there is a sequence space from space, uh, air, air, fire, water, and earth. We'll get into that. So, yes, we'll get into the mechanics or the, you know, what Brahmananduvalli tells, and our scriptures tell us, which are the, the, the raw material is given by God. And then the plus minus is happening in this world as we do it. And even the forest that you look at it, did somebody come and plant all those trees one by one? The creation came about, everything is there to begin with, right? You can plant new trees. But the basic material that leads to everything else is already provided for is what we are going to look at. Aarti ji had uh, raised her hand. Is there that there a question or you're good now? Okay. So yes. So mud is the common denominator in all of it. Our gross body is also mud. From mud into mud. From dust unto dust like Bible says. So that is a common denominator across everything here. Whatever we see. Now let's get into a little bit of philosophy and fundamentals around it. We'll take it from Sankhya Darshan. So today we are going to discuss the spider, Spider-Man. How it is related to the, there's a similarity between how a spider goes about creating its web and how our Upanishads have explained the coming about of this world as well. How it is created is what we are going to look at. See, we are... Again, not to lose the context, this shloka is talking about Brahman, God, right? The oblation is God, the doer is God, everything. So let's understand it from a fundamental level so that it's easy to relate to this concept. We simply go through the shloka, it's like, okay, everything is God, but we'll not go deeper. So we will try to understand it, um, taking some scriptural references around it. So let's start. Um, the Munda Kupanishad says, Okay, I'm not going to attempt to do that. As a spider projects forth and draws back its threads and, and as plants grow on earth, as hairs grow on the body, so does the universe emerge from the imperishable being. So this whole universe is actually like created. If you look at Mahavishnu, the Satya Sankal, he visualizes in his dream and everything comes about. Like a spider, when it creates, where does the material come from? Does it go and shop around for the material and then weaves a web? Of course not. If a goldsmith is going to create something, it has to buy gold from outside. Then it has to chisel it and create something out of it. But spider, when it goes about creating it, it comes from its own. And then finally, the web, it takes back into its own. It doesn't need to get that material from anywhere. And same thing is the case with the creation as well, which science calls as a big bang. So the God is the cosmic architect around it. Mahavishnu from every pore of his body, infinite universes are emanating. God is called Satya Sankal. He doesn't even have to do any work. He desires and it happens. Where does it come from? All this material from his body. And when the Pramahaprale happens, where does it go back? It goes back to his body. So it has been beautifully equated with the analogy of a spider. The creation just comes from God and goes back into God. Now, all the materials that we see, let's look at the hierarchy of how it gets formed. All the materials that are coming about. 
See, the beauty of our scriptures is it goes to the length of explaining. And if you, and I won't recommend you go and start reading all that stuff, but then it's very, very systematic. Five by five matrix, three by three matrix, how did it come about? It answers all the fundamental questions that science is still struggling with. You've taken a big leap of faith by saying a dense particle of mass exploded and, you know, creation came about. No, that's not the case. So what happens is what, what Sankhya Darshan tells us, let's look at the enumeration. We have a Purusha. It glances at Prakriti. From Through that comes a Mahantattu. Through Mahantattu comes the Ahamkar aspect of it. And then obviously the under the guidance of Gunas, they are the driving forces. You get the next entity that comes is Panchatan Matras, which is ether, air, fire, water, earth that Samji was talking about. And these Bhutas, through these Bhutas, the rest of the, if you look at our the sense of sound, the touch, form, taste, smell, they come. There's a direct mapping of these elements with the sense of sound, touch, taste, direct mapping if you look at it. And then of course our Karam Indriyas and Gyar Indriyas, they come into picture. And if you look at, there is a direct mapping here as well, right? You can map the ether element to sound and to, and to ear. Then you can map the skin element to touch and the air, the fire element to the form and the eye, tongue element to taste and water, earth element to smell and nose direct mapping okay this is how the creation comes about okay it, it, it is enumerated in sankhya darshan now for each element also it, it goes on to explain this is what we are going to focus on today so we have this is the first element ether it all starts with sky which corresponds to the hearing or the sound aspect of it now the compression of sky it leads to air sky you cannot feel sky. Now the sensation of feeling has come in air. When it compresses, it becomes air. Now that sensation of feeling has come, that is that maps to our skin. Air further compresses and it gives a form. Air you cannot see, but now fire has come. Now you, you can see that, which gives a sensation of to the eye where you can see it. And Agni Dev is called one of the Pratyaksh Devatas that we take oath in front of. Agni ko sakshi man ke we do feras and all that stuff, right? Because it is one of the Pratyaksh Devatas. Then fire, can you taste fire? You cannot taste fire, although you can see it. So fire further on compresses and becomes water. It brings in the sense of taste. Now you can taste it, but can you, can you smell water? You cannot. So next, the last one is the earth. It compresses to form that element makes the Pancha Mahabhut complete, which brings in the sense of smell as well. So if you look at it, the first one starts from sound and that is why our Brahman is also called Om because it all start, started with the word sound. If you meditate, it is said that you can hear that vibration. This our cosmic universe is actually saying that word, the Omkar thing. And it all started with sound, the sky part of it as well. So anyways, we'll not get too deep into it. Maybe we'll get into it when we get to that shloka because Lord Krishna further down in Bhagavad Gita say, amongst the syllables, I am Om. So we'll talk about Om in that case because a lot of people, they worship on Om, the impersonal aspect of God as well. Okay, But just for today's discussion, it emanated from the first, if you look at it, the Shabd was the first thing. It all started with sky, the sound. Right? And rest of the elements followed along. So what does it mean? Why, where are we heading, right? You must be wondering, so what? So the so what is that now the spider is weaving its web. This is the unfolding of the web. What is the unfolding of the web? The previous slide that you saw. Right? You saw this. This is how the web gets unfolded. The Purush glances at Prakriti, Mahantattu comes, Ahamkar comes, and everything gets unfolded. And we have looked at the earth. Earth, the derivative of Earth, we spoke about it as well. So now if you look at it, all the stuff that we saw, it's nothing but a derivative of mud. The precious stone, all the food and everything that we are eating, even the elements, the chemistry, we had a periodic table, right? If you look at your body, it's a microcosm of this universe only. You have all the elements in it. In fact, I think the ferrous element is created by interstellar, you know, those kind of... Um, um, what do you call that, collisions and stuff like that which happens and then those elements are created but our body, our bones, if you don't get all the 
uh, intestines are not doing its job, then you have to get the supplements around it because otherwise it will start extracting these chemicals that our body needs from your bones. And that is why your bones over a period of time start getting weaker. So it's a microcosm of pretty much all the elements that we need. Then if you look at it again, I think uh, it's not an exaggeration or it, uh, the fact is that it is all but a derivative of mud. Even our gross body is nothing but a mud. It's a recycled atom of mud, which goes back into mud. Regardless of which ritual we follow, whether we are a Parsi or a Hindu or a Christian or a Muslim, finally it gets the body gets transformed into mud only. Because it has come from mud, it will go back to mud. Soul is what our true identity is, which keeps on getting transmigrated, you know, based on our karmas and other things uh, that come into picture. So this is what we were talking about. It is nothing but a derivative of mud. And we saw the process of how the spider moves. You know, when the creation comes about, the web comes about. Now, let's look at the other aspect of it. Okay. Spider said that I have had enough. When you start with earth, earth will roll back into water. Okay. This is the time of Mahapralay. Hopefully, we are not around then. But this is how it will happen. Earth will come into water. Water to fire, to air, and then ether sky, and then it will roll back into the Panchtan Matras. Panchtan Matras will roll back into the Mahatattva, and then furthermore, oh, what's happening? Sorry, I was doing the other thing right. Mahan, and then Prakriti, and then Purusha, and then goes back into Vishnu's Mahodar once again. This is the reverse process. Have you seen any DVDs like? In the reverse, reminds me of a joke, you know, this guy, Samji was telling, so, so one of the torturous things that happen is when you go to somebody's place and they start showing you the video, you know, of some marriage in their family and you have to sit through it and watch it throughout. And every time you go, they'll show you that, right? Including some of those things. But, but the thing is, there was a guy who said, uh, whenever I feel uh, sad in my life, I watch my marriage DVD. How? In reverse. You know, I go back, go back, reverse the feras and I'm out of it. So anyway, so this, this is how the reverse cycle begins. Earth to water to fire to earth to ether and back into Purusha uh, is when the Mahapralay happens. This is the spider taking the web back. So if you look at it, it is the material that God had and it rolls back into God. Everything rolls back into it. So when everything is created, not created, I should say, created would be technically incorrect. Everything is manifested by God and again taken back into God, right? So is there anything other than that at all? That's the question, of course, right? This is what we need to be discussing about in the shloka. So we looked at this part um, and we also looked at the other part of it where the spider has woven its web and now it has taken it back. So that brings us to this question that if everything is Brahman, it's coming from God, going back into God, right? Even each entity is a derivative of mud, including our body itself, which is emanating from God itself, right? It's a constituent that God has manifested. So let's have a quick discussion just to understand this concept a little more. Now, here's a Okay, before I get into that, I wanted to take a question. There was a question that was raised yesterday. A um, couple of questions that came up. They are important questions. So I thought we will take it in today's session. That might help others as well. So first question came is, I really don't understand why I cannot complain. Right? Yesterday we spoke about one of the th principles, no complaints, no complaints in life. That basically stakes our claim for the inheritance, to inheritance that we... Um, deserve from God. So if I believe he's mine and I'm his, then why not tell him how I feel? It's a noble sentiment, of course, great sentiment. If we can truly think God is mine and I can take all the liberties, including pouring my heart out and complaining, great. Sure, that's a great sentiment for sure. However, having said that, um, it is called Sakam Bhakti. First of all, if you reach that stage, nothing like it. But second thing is, it is Sakam Bhakti, where you're still complaining because you, you are seeking something for yourself. And it is said that if you want divine love, then you have to get to the Nishkam Bhakti. It is called higher Bhakti. 
where you are not seeking for self but for the pleasure of god tat sukh sukhetvam so complaint means i am not happy with your decision and i know better than you and how could you do that to me but if you do that with full freedom thinking god is mine it is still a great sentiment because we have reached that stage but at the same time there is a higher goal as well where we don't even do that that is called nishkam bhakti so considering god as yours is a very very high level sentiment if you can get to that stage and and with the you know with adhikar or with the the full right that we have if you can converse with god and demand things and fight with him nothing like it uh it's a great great spot to be in i would say but at the same time if we go by scriptures there is a higher level of bhakti possible there we are still being delving in the sakam space not the nishkam space hopefully that answers if there is a follow up please uh, we can discuss that and second question that came up was doesn't god know when we will realize him isn't that due to our previous karma as you said earlier okay maybe that was not in case god wanted us to realize him in a certain stage what possibility we can realize him earlier if there be a chance how kindly explain okay now if god were to want want us to realize want us to realize him and it was in god's hand then there was no need for bhagavad gita he would have simply told krishna that you know i will i will make make it so don't worry just wait for that but the fact is god has given us a free will so this is a very very philosophical question i'd ask this to swami ji on one hand we say god is all powerful that means he knows everything one of the definitions of god is that he has to know everything now if we say god knows everything then of course this includes the very very definition of god knowing when we will realize god and if that is the case does that mean that we don't do not have a free will so swami ji answered it beautifully he see explained it he said yeah it's a philosophical question that you're asking but in this case even god doesn't know when we will realize god he he may have an indication looking at our nature and our past track record which he has a count of it's like when you see your kid you know if he's going to see this candy he will definitely fall for it or if this movie comes he's definitely going to complain that i need to watch it so he knows our tendencies he would have a fair amount of idea on what our next immediate decision would be but even he doesn't know because he has still given us a free will when we will prioritize it and take a turn he cannot predict that so god doesn't know when we will realize him he can have a bit of an idea that okay maybe we'll progress faster now that our favorable sanskars are coming or not but he doesn't know that because he's given us a free will around that if he could decide when we were to become god realize why would he make us wait we would simply make us god realize right in the next very moment and there was no need for scriptures and bhagavad gita as well so this is a very philosophical question and a very important one so i thought i'll i'll pick it up uh so yes even god doesn't know when we will realize him because it really depends on our free will and how much intensity we employ in our uh, progression on this path of spirituality this is how it goes okay now coming back to the topic that we had hope it answered the question it was asked uh, if you have questions please keep putting it in feedback tracker i would try to take it during the session so that we can have a good discussion on it now here's an ant it has gone on a sugar hill okay this mountain of a sugar so just imagine the luck of an ant which comes across a sugar hill nothing like it right hitting a jackpot now it goes around the sugar hill and circles around that as well and along the way along the tour it kept eating away along the way enjoying it because it's a mountain and why would she forfeit that op- opportunity however after coming back it reported that it tasted salty it didn't taste good how is it possible anybody wants to take this question okay i can see some smiles here yeah please go ahead i know you all have been listening yes ashutosh ji radhe radhe please go ahead uh i think i hear this but he is having salt in his mouth the and that's why he is tasting salt every time true very true good i can see that smile so yes samji you wanted to answer as well yes samji radhe radhe 
Please go ahead. Rather, are they the same thing um, the ant, the particular ant had some kind of salt in her mouth, in her mouth. And that's why she was saying it's salty, 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 because already she had some kind of, in this way, physical salt was there. Same way, but we, all of us have the mentally or bad ideas in our mind. That's why we keep on thinking the bad way. Good. Right. So the fact that is uh, the other yes, side. Samji, Rathi, Rathi. Samji. Yeah, Samji. the first answer that got to my mind was maybe the ant lied. Then after listening to their answers, I thought maybe it got jaundice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I should have I should have qualified the ant with that on ant is not naughty. Okay, it's a very honest ant. Okay, so yeah, but yeah, that's a good way of uh, lateral thinking around it. But yeah, it was not lying; it actually felt it salty, and the reason for that was not the fault was not in the hill or the surroundings where it was actually going, the fault was in the sense, right? It was having a lump of salt that it was carrying throughout. So similarly, although we have God everywhere around us, okay, if you look at it, God has, he's saying, Mahato Mahan Ananya Nan, basically bigger than the biggest, smaller than the smallest. That means Vishnu, when this creation came about, he has actually permeated every atom of this creation. Okay, so this this actually world is the, the entire every atom that you see around is God. There is nothing but God everywhere, including the soul. He is permeated, right? Our super soul is also God, and despite that, we don't experience that. And the reason for that is obviously our senses are imperfect at this point. It's not that God is not present, he is present, but our senses are imperfect. We are like this ant, which is going around in this sugar hill, but with the salt in its tongue. And the day that lump of salt is taken away, our realization of God will come to the fore. Okay, that taste of God, right? Like gopis, they say, Jit dekhu, tit sham they could understand. And the same thing happens with saints as well. Not with us at this point, um, once our senses and heart or antakaran is purified, then uh, it will automatically reveal itself, this whole understanding of God itself, right? So that is the whole idea. So if you look at the creation aspect of it, we saw that like a web of, a web of a spider, God doesn't need any material. It just creates by itself and rolls it up into itself. Now, when it comes to us, there's a bit of a difference here. Okay, let's look at that as well. Have a quick discussion. So, um, the objects of the world they are made from Maya, the material energy of God, as we saw. Right now, here you see the fire. The fire also has three layers on top of it, right? Look, then there is fire. There's a layer of light, and then the smoke. So that layer is there as well. So energy is both one with its energetic and also different from it. Although technically all of it is fire, but still it has different layers. It has a luminous zone and, and, and I think in um, chemistry you would, you would have studied more. But then the energy and the energetic, you know, they have a relationship and at the same time there's a difference as well. It can be considered as different from the fire because it exi exists outside of or it can be reckoned as part of the fire itself. Similarly, if we go along and look at the sun rays as well, the sun has come, right? When you look at the window, so sun rays, will you call sun rays different from the sun? No. They are the same, but at the same time, there, there is a difference there. So energy is both distinct from the energetic and yet a part of it. So sun rays are there, surface of sun is there, core of sun is there as well. All of it is sun and yet it is having different, uh, what do you call that, different properties. Now similarly, if you look at our cells here, there are three eternal entities our scriptures say. What are those? The first one is the Brahm that we are talking about, Brahman. The second one is 
the jeev shakti and the third one is maya okay these are all three identity i entities nobody created anyone and nobody can destroy anyone okay this is also an important concept it's not like god created us or god created maya these are three eternal entities they roll back into god that is a different thing but it's not they are destroyed right one of the first concepts in physics that we had studied was energy can neither be created nor be destroyed so it's like the same thing these three are eternal entities so we are not going anywhere maya is also not going anywhere and god is anyway we know eternal so we are eternal maya is eternal god is eternal but yes we can get maya nivrit we are maya dhin because we are facing maya and god is maya dhish and maya is subservient to god okay now even in shloka uh, this shloka in bhagavad gita god talks about the soul in 7.5 god is saying soul too is the spiritual energy of it is a spiritual energy called jeev shakti and such is my inferior energy but beyond it oh mighty arm darjun i have a superior energy this is the jeev shakti the soul energy which comprises the embodied souls who are the basis of life in this world so everything is god and god's energies okay that is the one part having said that there is still a difference between energy and energetic we spoke about our cells as well right in our body also we have nails and hair they have different manifestation they are not sentient part of nail is sentient and part of it is not so if you go beyond the point then it is sentient so same way although everything is god here and yet at the same time there is a difference in its energies as well so a wise person if we go back to the shloka here so well, let's continue a little more scriptural reference chaitanya mahaprabhu also in chaitanya charitamrit he said that Lord Krishna is energetic, soul is his energy, right? In Vishnu Puran also it is said it is simultaneously one and yet different from God. But the key is it is God's energy only. It is not a separate entity which has come from somewhere else. It is God's energy only. Everything actually emanates from Brahman only and goes back into Brahman at the time of Mahapralaya. So everything, any object that you see around is made up. God has permeated it. It has God in it. so the wise people who actually reach that conception they are able to experience that so if you go back to the shloka it's talking about the same concept like right? when you offer an oblation when you offer an oblation then the ladle that you use is brahman the person who is doing is brahman the you know the fire is brahman and pretty much everything it's basically saying they are able to uh, appreciate not appreciate but understand that everything is god and his manifestation only that is a pretty advanced stage right but that is essentially what this shloka is talking about now what is the practical relevance of it in our life so to say when we do our work so when we do a yagya there are a few things right there is a ghee involved there is a ladle involved there is a priest involved so who is the priest who is the ladle uh, what is the ghee every act that we do Just think about it. If we have this consciousness that is shloka is talking about, then like Swami Vivekananda beautifully said that all work is devotional, nothing is secular. So you can actually bring in that consciousness there, right? The instrument that you are using to perform work becomes your ladle. That is God because it's being energized by God. And what is what is the ghee that you would use in that yagya? Anybody who wants to take that question, what would be the ghee? which will like when you put ahuti in yagya the ghee uh, is the catalyst there right which enables that uh, fire what would be the ghee in that case let me take an example it might become easier if anybody wants to take that yes shyam ji yes shyam ji please go ahead radhe radhe is it my ego ahem um uh, yeah it's you are something but not ego i would say anybody else okay let me take that concept then just with an example so that it becomes a little yes uh, anybody... yes ganapriya ji radhe radhe please go ahead 
Okay. Uh, yes. Not this go ahead. Yes. This is the bhakti bhav, the devotion. Yeah, that's that's true. So if you look at it, let me take an example. Um, it will add more color to it, and then we can have a discussion. How do we map it to our day-to-day -day activity? It's a very interesting concept. So we spoke about all these entities. Okay. Now, root dhyan yagya when we are doing, or any work we are doing, we ourselves are the priests. Okay, in that case, what is the ladle? The tongue or the mind, which is doing the act. It becomes our ladle. We are using that instrument. Mind, right? The ghee is the remembrance during that act. The consciousness that we build, right? We are doing it for the pleasure of God. That becomes our ghee. Agni is the God consciousness, of course, because we are offering it to that becomes pure. If you are doing it with the consciousness that I am doing it for my enjoyment, uh, that so that thing that we spoke about yesterday, if that so that is anything other than God, then it becomes tainted because it isn't material. But if you put it God consciousness there, then it becomes um, the Agni. Everything becomes pure at that point. And yagya shisht or the outcome of this yagya becomes the peace or the satisfaction that you get. What do you get out of the yagya? The purification of heart, the good qualities and the Lord himself, you get closer to that part. So every work actually, I've just picked up an example here. Every act that we do, you can map it. Who is the priest will always be us. Right? The ladle would be the instrument that you are using to do that. I picked up an example of rutyan or chanting here, but it could be any work that you are doing that becomes your ladle at that point. The key is the remembrance act that you are doing. And Agni becomes a consciousness that you inculcate at that point so that you can offer it and it becomes purified. And what you get out of that Yagya on Sampoon of this Yagya is these things. These, these are the outcomes of that. You'll get satisfaction. It will purify your heart and senses. Of course, it will result in the Devic Gun, which are the good qualities and it will take you a step closer to God realization. So if you actually look at it from a practical aspect of the shloka, first of all, let's understand everything that you see is permeated by God. Okay, there's nothing other than God, right? Like that spider example. And secondly, every act that you do, when you understand everything is actually energized by God, you can actually bring in that consciousness, understanding that I don't understand it. I'm like that ant, you know, which is, although the sugar is all around me, but I'm not experiencing it, but then there's nothing stopping me from simulating it in my head so that I can get closer by purifying myself. Every act can actually become a yagya in that case. This Brahma Arpanam that we are talking about. Yes, uh, Sri Ramayaji, you had a question? Yes, Ramayaji. Please go ahead, Radhe Radhe. Uh, Radhe Radhe, like, this is a question and a contemplation also. So if I have to map this to my day-to-day -day tasks of working or cooking or whatever, then if I'm doing it with the remembrance of God, it is like adding ghee to the fire of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that fire of, uh, increases or the light increases. But if I'm not remembering God and uh, uh, just doing it uh, mindlessly or something, then... Uh, I'm pouring something else into my consciousness, which is dimming my consciousness. Should I see it that way? That's right. Because see why we talk it about fire, because the property of fire is that no matter what you put to it, it becomes pure. Fire doesn't become impure. Anything yeah. that you put to fire becomes pure. So the only way you can purify your act is by putting it to something which is pure. And pure thing is what? God. That's only pure thing. Right? We are talking about Shuddha Sattva here. God or saints. So unless we bring God into the mix, it cannot be pure. It can have a color of Sattva, which is relatively pure. Then the other gunas, Rajas and Tamas, but it is still not absolutely pure. Make sense? Yes, yes, Nitinji. Thank you. Got it. Okay, okay. Yes. Any other questions around it or how we can map it to our day-to-day -day activities? Anything that you want to bring up on that? I know we covered a lot today, but this shloka, um, at least it, it confused me for a long time. Um, but uh, with so the... There is a question, Nitinji, mm -hmm. from Lakshmi ji, if I can take that. Uh, she has asked, so the peace or satisfaction we get is also karma? 
peace or satisfaction is an outcome of the the act that we have performed in godly consciousness it's an outcome of that see what we are talking about these principles these principles will give us see why we won't undertake anything which will not give us peace or something good right that is how we are because we are seeking bliss so these principles when you start aligning to them then they your experience will tell you that what you are experiencing by performing these things or aligning to these principles is something much superior to what you would have otherwise experienced in material world okay so when you perform sacrifice it purifies when you help uh, you know somebody with a consciousness that you are serving god so what you get in return is something that can be experienced only so the peace that you get the purification of heart that you get um uh, and the and the noble virtues you can you are able to align to that will tell you they your experience will tell you that you know you have tasted something which was very much more relishable than anything um that you have tasted before it's not karma it is the consequence of that act that you have done even when we perform exercise and stuff like that right we take a bit of an austerity that serotonin production tells us that okay now i'm feeling happy so this goes beyond that actually mm mm-hmm. all right thank you nitin ji i can take uh, uh, himlata ji's uh, question radhe radhe himlata ji please go ahead uh, yes please go ahead ah uh, yes i have a question this is about the yagya i mean uh, we call roop gyan yagya is every act considered a yagya i mean how can we relate a yagya to an act or a karma i picked an example of rupyan it was easy basically just so that we could relate to it however every act like i said vivekanand had said that every act is devotional nothing is secular so every act can become a devotion right for example if we are cooking who is the priest you are the priest there what do we need to do yagya we need a priest then we need a ladle through which we do the ahuti then we need the ghee right and then we need the agni so every act if let's say i'm cooking i become the priest in that case what is the ladle you are using your uh, you know instruments to make food you know it could be your hand in this case or or your consciousness that you have at that point in time right that becomes your ladle you keep it pure that's why they say the consciousness in which you prepare it that it gets reflected in the taste as well so the taste that you get from your mom's food you don't get it in a restaurant because the consciousness is at play there as well that becomes your ladle you keep it pure okay you are doing it as a service basically it's like gopis would even cook food what if krishna comes and tastes it okay i better make it something that will really delight him so we start putting our consciousness um, again that part is also that becomes your ladle ghee is the remembrance part of it right here you bring in god that i have to do it to the best of my ability so that it pleases god right even if you are feeding your son or your family you want to do it the best job you want to present your best version of cooking to them because it will please god it's not like chalta hai attitude so everything becomes devotional in that case if we actually look at it that way and that is a habit we need to form our mind is not attuned to that as yet right and gradually we can systematically build that habit that habit yeah. is natural okay. it's like an immediate gratification what i can get out of it but the 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 sooner we start building that consciousness and the closer we'll start getting to that right eventual aim is sarveshu kaleshu ma manusmar that's what krishna's injunction to arjuna is and satat nitat satat yukta naam nitya abhyukta naam so he's used that satat yukta naam yukt word multiple times in bhagavad gita which basically tells that not even there should not there should not be any interruption in between it has to be a constant flow of thought right that consciousness so that consciousness now he is giving you tips basically here that can be built only when we start bringing god into our consciousness with every act that we perform gradually so so every karma should be like a service to god then then it becomes a yagya and then yeah so it becomes okay. yagya perfect. perfect perfect yeah thank you so much you can thank you and habit right it the it's like that pull we have gravitational pull right it's not easy to overcome a habit and our mind is habituated to thinking in a certain way 
right? So when you send the rocket to the space, the maximum number of amount of fuel is burnt in the first few seconds. It mm -hmm. yeah. And right. once it gains momentum, then the centripetal force takes care of it. So it starts orbiting around. Same thing happens in this path as well, because our mind is, um, you know, attuned to thinking in a certain way. And that habit has to be dismantled gradually. It will take a lot of effort to begin with, but gradually it will become a mindset. And once it becomes a mindset, it's like orbiting around the, you know, you don't need any fuel anymore at that point. It just happens naturally. But initially, obviously, it will take effort. We are not used to it. How do I bring God into it? I mean, I'm doing it. Um, but that's that's essentially um, what Lord Krishna is telling us. And, and these tips are available to us. How do we start making everything devotional, bringing in that consciousness and start bringing God into the mix? That will purify us, give us the peace. And um, as part of our preparatory bhakti, which is called sadhan bhakti, it will really give us a push in that. What we are doing is called sadhan bhakti, preparatory bhakti. Finally, God will intervene and grace us and then it becomes siddha bhakti. Then it will become, you know, now right now we have to pull our mind, force our mind to get, get into godly consciousness. Once he graces it, we, it gets into siddha bhakti, then you'll have to do the other way around. Okay, okay, my friend has come in order to operate effectively with the friend. So okay, okay, let me take a step down. Right? Like Paramhans, when they descend on this earth, they become Hans first of all, because otherwise they cannot operate. If you say Krishna, God everywhere, they cannot even operate. How will they give lectures or talk to people? So they first become Hans, they step down. And then they start, you know, preaching and writing literature and talking around it. But even in Siddha Bhakti, Part of it you can start experiencing where you have to step down to operate effectively in this world. Otherwise, people will say this person has gone crazy. Okay. So. Beautifully explained. Thank you, Natanji. It's a good spot to be in, actually. Right? If if actually you go there, in that spot, it's a very great spot to be in. Um, very good situation to be in. There's a lecture from Maharaj. It's like he says that people who who get into worship in advanced stages of bhakti, right? Or even otherwise, even in initial stages, dunya, people start calling them mad. Mm. Right? And for them people, for those people, if they look at the world, they seem mad. They said everybody is mad in this world. Somebody for God <laughs> and somebody without God. And then he said even the person who made, uh, he created, he's also mad. So there's a very interesting lecture on, you know, everybody's mad basically. So for you, that person... Mm mad for that person you'll be mad so one is mad for god mad in a good way one is mad for maya not so much in a good way so wow beautifully said um i see a couple of hand raised so i'll take Menkati. please go ahead radhe, radhe, radhe. Ji. yeah radhe, radhe, um, i have quick two questions actually um but both are simple so um this Brahmarpanam Brahma, where we do generally before we taking any food, uh, right, sir? Uh, we do before taking any food. Is that correct? Or, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a food shloka as well. We teach it to kids also. It's a good practice to offer it to God with this shloka because just, uh, just telling, basically acknowledging that all of it is provided by God only. So, yeah, we, it's a food shloka also. We can recite it before having food too. Yeah. So the, the other question I have is thank you for that. And the other question is 2.47 that uh, Karmanya Vadi Karaste. So is there any correlation between this one and that one? Is there any link between these two? Is what I'm kind of thinking because this is Brahmarpanam that is also that. Uh, so Brahma all... The Brahmarpana Arpanam aspect of it is like offer it to God, right? That is the relation here. But Lord Krishna is having a flanking approach, right? From multiple ways he's explaining you. In that one, he's talking about how to offer the fruits of your results to God. But here he's going much deeper. This is saying pretty much everything is Brahman. And if you think about the shloka, that's why I had to dabble with it for a long time. And everything is God, basically. Because it's emanating from him, going back to him. Anything and everything that you see is permeated by God. Right? This laptop, this mic, everything is permeated by God. Why? Because... At a subatomic level, if you look at it, it is called Garbo Deshai Vishnu in our scriptures say it permeates every atom. If, if he doesn't permeate that, right, the rotation, if you look at it at a subatomic level, 
things are moving around orbiting at even macro scale it's happening at a um, large level as well right planets and then galaxies there everything is rotating around everything so even on a micro level that rotation if that rotation stops forget about rotation also even if the the spin of the axis tilts slightly or the mass of that subatomic particle changes everything will become plasma so how is it auto magically sustained because god is present permeated that right? even the every planet the axis the spin the tilt the velocity the mass everything is so perfect so god is actually permeated everything there is nothing around you which is not god this is essentially what this shloka is saying so he is saying offer your fruit to god that is one aspect of it even the act that you are doing the instrument that you are using to do that act everything is god that is the consciousness paramhams develop actually but then you cannot operate in this world so they step down and and then then that is how they operate everything is god actually around you this even the when you close the door uh, these people have a consciousness you know slam it don't slam it too hard uh, that kind of sentiments gentleness starts coming in you that is a pretty but everything is god actually anything and everything around you is brahman it's created in brahman and it is emanated so, nothing so just, so just for my understanding so can i consider this as a more advanced level than that uh, 2.47 which attach only given giving the results are uh, uh, offering the results there here it is everything is god you can say that yeah is here is ex, ex, extending that definition basically just to bring in that concept that's thank true. you so much nitin ji thank you here you can make your work also devotional there he is saying okay you offer the fruits to me but everything actually can become a yagya in this case that is essentially what the shloka is saying it's a pretty deep one very profound one actually and that is why that kathopanishad spider example also uh, and how it gets created and the reverse cycle when it rolls back just so that you understand this whole creation and god has to be bigger than the biggest in order to sustain this creation it's just like a bird holding something in its beak right it, it's a bird holding something in its beak so god is bigger than the biggest and smaller than the smallest both dualities continues yes. wow. there's nothing other than god basically whatever we see around us so wow a very deep a very profound concept thank you nitin ji for explaining before we move ahead i want to remind everyone that i have posted feedback tracker please uh, put in your uh, feedback comment questions and uh, in the feedback tracker yes please do that and if you have questions um, please do i will bring it like like we did today um, from time to time that way we can have a good discussion on it now tomorrow we were going to again do a quick detour because um, we'll talk about guru tattva tomorrow because we have maharaj ji celebrations coming up we'll not get time next week so i wanted to talk a little bit about uh, guru tattva and some concepts around that uh, which will be a very interesting discussion you will you'll find it very very relevant and meaningful so we will discuss that uh, tomorrow and day after so asha ji has mentioned incredible session no words for this thanks again dhanyawad asha ji yes uh, sandhya ji radhe radhe please go ahead uh, radhe radhe i had uh, two questions one is like when you talked about the panch mahabhut um, uh, prakriti mahan ahamkar so so all of this come under the maya energy of god is that correct very good that's that's right okay so that was just clarification and the second is uh, when we talk about this um, yagya um so the the ghee is the remembrance of god and uh, agni is uh, god consciousness so i am not able to distinguish between distinguish, these really. yeah. distinguish between the two right yeah so yeah ghee is basically um, you are putting it offering it to god you can call it that as an agni offering it to god the, the act of offering it basically agni is all pure you are offering it to god 
you are remembering god and then offering it to god so basically yeah, i can see the confusion or overlap around there but ghee is the catalyst there where the deeper you remember the better it is right and then there's actually no distinction between remembering and offering at that point right both go hand in hand so both you can there's an overlap basically there between ghee and fire in that case because if you're remembering you don't have to do it separately right right, right. there's no distinction between remembering and then okay now i'm remembering but i i have to remember offering as well so it's it probably happens simultaneously one one after another yeah and just to mention quickly like you have earlier also taught us this that god's three energies maya yoga maya and jeev shakti so i think at least for me that itself was enough to feel that everything is god so this of course elaborated and showed us things that we see around us how it connects with maya and yoga maya but that itself is amazing concept to realize that everything around us as is god you know? true we have two frontiers to cross actually see the the reason there is a veil in front of us we cannot see god there are two things we have to conquer maya and then we have to go past yoga maya both mm-hmm. so in order to conquer maya obviously we need god's grace and then through his grace only he will shed the curtain of yoga maya as well and reveal himself that will also happen through his grace so we have two curtains to overcome um so in our hands if we look at it purely um, from practical standpoint if we perfect sadhan bhakti mm-hmm. i think we have hit a very nice milestone in this life right so sadhan bhakti means um, when the thoughts of god we start remaining in that remembrance that itself is a great milestone right where god has now you have fought, reached the tipping point of siddha bhakti where he started gracing you it's a great milestone and if you get into siddha bhakti bhav bhakti and all nothing like it but if even if we prepare ourselves you know that vessel initial that itself is a big deal on this path where your mind automatically flows towards god and you don't have to you know put in an external a lot of effort to take it away and it's it seems like a bit of a struggle at that point and i have actually seen devotees in bhav bhakti also which is very inspiring to see them it's like they are in a different world altogether okay and i i have seen that two step process where they they are like lost and then they come back okay just to engage with you i don't know how that happens but it can happen so it is possible it is doable so we only yeah. need to aspire for that sam ji you don't seem very yes. impressed with this yeah thank you nitin ji we'll move on uh, i see a couple of hand raises padma ji radhe radhe please go ahead radhe radhe good to hear you padma ji after a while <laughs> so few things i just want to like loop back and um it might be heavy but just just listen and process and um penance right when when we try to understand penance rather than experience penance then we get into this trouble but penance is nothing but an act of worship so if you take this baby step of act of worship any act of worship and the key word here is act of worship and that penance is it can be done constantly like constantly it can be done while you're talking and walking and showering and helping your child eating uh, doing whatever you need to do when you are in that state of you know for the language purpose we say this the 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 mindset but it's 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 more than a mindset where you are uh, connected with your heart more than your mind your mind kind of does not do the majority of the work but your heart is doing the majority of the work when you're in that state of penance or the act of worship where even if you want to force yourself materialistically and you want to do something you kind of forced and pulled by a force where your mind constantly goes to any god 
constantly goes to any mind any form any shape you know if if you believe in durga devi if you believe in shiva if you believe in buddha if you believe in um seeing swami ji if you believe in seeing even nitin ji as a guru anything pure thing anything that you can think of your mind constantly goes to that state of purity that is a state of penance where your act of worship is in play while you're functioning bodily where you are not feeling where you're not feeling like you're emotionally sacrificing something is not a penance right where we feel like we are sacrificing emotionally where we are sacrificing something physically it just a spiritual experience that only you can experience and you go through it and you know that you're going through it and there is no two ways about it but you're in that state where you are so emotional which mean like spiritually emotional where you are tearing you are you are you are tearing and you don't know why you're tearing from inside you know you your eyes are tearing but you just can't explain why you're tearing it's just that state of inner experience that you go through where you're not feeling like you're sacrificing something emotionally you're not sacrificing anything physically but just that pouring of the ghee is you're just pouring back in that process or the penance where the outcome is just more bliss and more um, um experience of what is that you are supposed to experience rather than you're struggling from your mind to actually understand something so that that i feel is that state of penance if um uh, where you are you are automatically gravitated to bring your mind to any form or any shape maybe a bhajan maybe a form of god maybe a form of devi maybe a form of uh, guru maybe a form of anything that pulls you back and draws you back to god um that that is is um is penance or 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 the act of worship where that act or the karma comes into the picture is the act of worship where you are going through that process of penance where you are purifying your mind and purifying your soul and you can experience that where you are you are actually going through that process and and, and you just you just have to trust it believe it and keep at it that's now that's a great great uh, realization that you shared uh, true and that's a state i think we need to aspire for where it becomes effortless as effortless as a river is drawn to a sea right river just finds its way to the sea and when our thoughts start gravitating towards god for anything and everything that's where i think we are on the right track and you beautifully um, articulated it padma ji and it should come to a stage where it becomes effortless initially effort would be required because our mind is not habituated to do that but once we get into a flow into a rhythm then it will really become effortless and then if god starts supplementing it with the siddha bhakti aspect of it then oof right that's essentially what we need at that point but the 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 knowledge part of it let's not underestimate it because there are too many things that are yet to happen on this path okay so we we should um, keep our focus on the goal without getting sidetracked you know if good things start happening to us along the way because god can test us by giving us distraction and also mystic abilities right like so those kind of things have to be rejected with knowledge and not get sidetracked on this journey that is the knowledge comes in extremely important knowledge is very very important nobody can underestimate the significance of knowledge right chaitanya mahaprabhu had said siddhant bhale chitte kar karuna alas basically just never be lazy when it comes to acquiring contemplating and revising the knowledge um but great point padma ji yes we have to reach a stage where it just gravitates towards god naturally automatically it's like when you close your eyes you are in meditation okay that is the stage we need to reach it's all and you when you open your eyes and that's when you um, you know it's no back so basically you can carry that forward in your um, you know the meditation throughout the day that is the ideal state right now we have to struggle right when we sit but the moment you close you are into it kind of a deal okay one more hand i see couple of hands let yes. me take uh, ssg please go ahead try to write ssg please yeah. triple sg triple sg 
اس 3G يعطيك العافيه سيوا سادنا اند ستسنگ ستسنگ that is what the 3s stand for yes please go ahead ya gadi gadi namaskar aur sir ya end point of our existence means uh, is not in our hands like old age disease emotional turmoil so but for our throughout our life span we should strive for moksha so at the but there is no feedback loop to us because we won't remain nor to our but not to the people who remain behind us when we depart and even during our existence whether we will get moksha that feedback or that signal also we are unable to comprehend means uh, uh, like i am 10% near 20% near 40% near or i am on different track so even your horoscope or uh, any such methods fail to no uh, let me know during my lifetime that i am going on the path to moksha now how i relate this to this uh, yagya is my i am treating my entire life span as yagya and the outcome of yagya is to be moksha but to understand that um, i have got or not that is secret between god and me only which is not known to any other who are surviving behind for example uh, uh, even for my parents also we are unsure uh, where they are right now or in what state they are or how they how we can uh, uh, attempt for their moksha so uh, i have i have plenty of questions in that area sure we can continue our discussion i can see that so first of all you can't attempt for somebody else moksha everybody's journey is their own journey even if that was the case uh, when we come in contact with a god or like saint the first thing they will give us okay moksha i would say moksha we should not go for we should go for divine love but anyways then god uh, guru will give us in a platter right so we cannot do it for others second thing i think what you asked was what are the milestones right how do i know um, what are some of the indications or Um, yes you can get along the way right so there are milestones we'll talk about those milestones on the path of bhakti um and then the milestone in case of ashtang yoga and uh, gyan yoga is samadhi finally dhyan and samadhi these are the last two stages of ashtang yoga and in gyan yoga also you know the dhyasan and then finally samadhi comes but there are certain indications you can get along this path right how much how much uh, uh, sharanagat or surrender or let go Uh, you are experiencing in your life how much reduction in bitterness envy and anger you are experiencing in life how much less agitated you feel in life how much equanimity you have gained in life these are some of the indicators self indicators but how far away we are on how much we have progressed only god and guru would know there's no other way for us to know but we we can get a sense of it you know we can compare our previous version with this version and see Am I, am i getting better at it or do i get irritated with every small thing right am i getting those negative thoughts more often or less mm-hmm. often now right am i able to maintain equanimity when things go wrong or i get excited mm-hmm. hyper sad some of the indications we can get around it but we can discuss that uh, so if you can put in the feedback tracker maybe we can have a little bit of an offline conversation uh, but it's our own journey we cannot do anything for anyone okay it's our own journey nobody can do anything for anybody for that matter even guru cannot do anything he can show us the path he can help us he can facilitate the process but we only have to do the hard work around it okay yeah thank you thank you thank you where are you joining us from yes. sir so i am from pune oh pune, pune. Yeah. please do fill in the feedback tracker we can have some offline yeah. conversation as well thank yes, you yes sir thank you All right. Last but not the least, Samji. Yes, Samji. Radhe Radhe. Please go ahead. Radhe Radhe. So, um, so this verse uh, sounded like it um, emphasizes more on more on Advaita aspect. Um, it it did. If not. I'm not wrong, huh? It did not because I brought in did not between energy and energetic, right? I said yeah. There is a relation, and at this at okay. yet at the same time, energy is different. 
Yeah, correct. Right? Okay. Energy is different. I give you an example of body also. Even though it's our body, but our nails and hair are different. Even though it so is that... our, the light and smoke aspect is mm. different from the actual thing, right? So there is similarity. <clears throat> Technically, it's same. Technically, it is all God. But if you go into a little more detail, <clears throat> there is a difference between the energies of God as well. So the, then how does um, Paramahamsa see? They see everything as God, right? They can see Krishna. They, will they differentiate energy and energetic in their bowels? Like internally? When I become Paramahansa, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> so basically, the way, the way of, at least theoretically I've understood is that <clears throat> Hans is like which can take the milk and leave the water. Mm -hmm. And Paramahansa sees only the milk. Yes. Okay. Shukadev was a Paramahans. Even Vedras was a Paramahans. But then he became Hans. Just <laughs> the literature and stuff like that okay <coughs> Top oh, so, yeah sorry go ahead. so that means um the actual advaita philosophy given by Shank, adi shankaracharya was that he seed he sees uh, water and milk as milk but paramhamsa sees only milk but not water i mean there is no concept of water at all There's so no that's water. even difference. water water they see as milk who paramhamsas yeah it's yeah. Krishnamai, right? Sub Jagat is like Krishnamai for them. The entire world is the veritable. So they can see basically God in everything. That is the state they reach at that point. Then how is it different from Advaita philosophy given by Shankaracharya? What Advaita philosophy? He say, see, Advaita philosophy, and now we're getting into technicalities of it. Advaita philosophy came in after Buddhism, right? So it mm -hmm. says Aham Brahmasmi. He focused only on one aspect of it. There's a difference as well with God, right? He, the fact that you are able to see, perceive God in everything does not mean that you, you think you have become God as well. Okay, there's still a difference. Yes. There's a technical difference between you and God, right? So mm -hmm. the Paramhans in the Bhakti Vang, they know that difference too. They, they become, they can see God in everything. That is the state they reach. But at the same time, that does not mean that they consider themselves as God at that point, right? Okay, okay. You can still have okay. the Dvaitras there. Mm -hmm. okay. Right? Shukhev Paramhans, he was his samadhi was so strong that nobody could get him, budge him out of that. Then Vedvya said, go say this verse in his ear. Mm -hmm. And that the verse was basically Marha uh, Pida. That Gopi Geet we had. So he recited that verse in his ear. Now, if he was in complete Advait, then what is there to be known? He is already in that thing, but yeah. it shook him out of that trance. Okay. Okay. So it was Advait. What is there to what? If you are in Advait, basically means that you are at the at basically there is no difference between you and God at that point, right? You are in that rasa. But this verse, when it was put in his ear, you know, his eyes opened up just like that. So that, that is the pull of the Sagun Sakar Swarup of God and the Dvaitras. That is essentially what it is. Yeah. We can continue that discussion. Anyways, anything else? I know we are over time. Um, uh, no. it, was a, it was a very deep sloka for sure today. Um, but I hope we were able to do a little bit of justice to it. Maybe we'll bring it again. One of the shlokas. It's very deep actually, this one. It, it is indeed very deep. Uh, I see Samji's, uh, Shamji's hand raised. Yes, Shamji. Please go ahead. Radhe, Radhe. Uh, nothing much. Let's, since it was a very heavy topic today. So on the lighter side, I would like to say that I will not be able to attend tomorrow's class. Oh. So video will be off. I am traveling for my niece's wedding with Jim Corbett. So that's all. I will miss you all. Though you may miss me not, but that's it. <laughs> Radhe, Radhe. I will miss seeing you for sure, Shamji. Um, but yeah, we will so I will the Guru Tattva concept that we are going to discuss anyway, so you'll not miss much. I will try and join on the way since the internet is very uh, uh, slow nowadays, so I'll try. So I will be on the session by from Tuesday morning. Uh, like anyway, note. By the way, next week I wanted to let you know, I think these sessions will probably coincide with the centenary celebrations for Jagat Guru Kripaluji Maharaj next week. So we may have our session from Thursday, I believe. So there are three oh. days. Yeah, I don't know. I think Monday to Friday, there's, there's going to be celebrations and 
it's going to probably coincide with that i'll check it out and let you know regardless theek hai thank you so much radhe radhe if travels and happy vacation to you sham ji thank yeah. you so much yaar thank you so happy much happy vacation sham ji looks like you are not going to miss much ha huh? <laughs> i will miss you all that's for sure <laughs> plus you me i i do miss my sessions on weekends um so uh, all right thank you sham ji I saw Ankur Ji's hand raised a couple of time, and then he it's got his good. hand down. So, Ankur Ji, do you have still the question, or are your questions answered already? Do you want to? Uh, do you want to speak? Let me unmute you. Radhe Radhe, please go ahead. Radhe Radhe, I just lowered my hand just because uh, we were about to end the session. A quick. Uh, uh, thing which i wanted to confirm was uh, nitin ji you were saying something about uh, ways we are said in someone's ears i mean i just uh, couldn't hear that properly shukadev his own son shukadev he did not come out of his mother's womb because he said maya will you know so after the, he was born he he became a 12 year old and he simply walked to the forest okay and went sat in a samadhi So Vedavyas was like, and he used to correct Vedavyas recitation and shlokas and interpretation from the mother's womb only. So yeah. then, uh, in order to break his samadhi, because he was Paramahans, Vedavyas said, "Okay, go and recite this verse in his ear." And the moment he heard that verse, his eyes, that was the bliss of Lord. That particular verse from Gopi Geet that was recited in his ear. So even Paramahans are shaken out of samadhi when you are talking about Krishna and his Dwaitras. aspect of it that is the whole idea even janak for that matter janak was a brahmalin okay uh, sam ji for and ramayan janak ji he was a brahmalin he was situated in that advait ras for that matter but when rod ram came and you know he saw him and his fragrance came into his nostrils his mind and heart got tugged towards him he said okay i can't how can it happen to me he was a brahmalin guy that is the power of sagun sakar word okay we can steal your heart so that is why that dwaitras uh, you know enjoying that being a madhumakhi and serving god is much more blissful than becoming the honey itself beautifully said thank you i saw sam ji's hand raised also a couple of times and then he uh yes, sam ji please go ahead i can yes see. sam ji do you have a still your question please go ahead uh, radhe radhe yeah i think the session was getting over so i thought that's why i thought maybe a load on my head i think i was not comment on that one hans says uh, other family said uh, hans is a little bit can differentiate between the right and wrong like milk and water differentiate and drink the milk only the farm hans is like the chatak chatak uh, the chatak nakshatra that bird they they wait only for that particular boon The water, so that's why Shukde. You can say Shukde with the Paramhans, Paramhans and Chatak. The Chatak is practically the same, I guess. That's my understanding. Is there? Yeah, they don't take anything. There is so yeah. Chatak is it. It will die, but it will not drink anything other than the water drop that falls down at the time of Swati Nakshatra. That is the. Uh, attribute or characteristic of a chatak so we all have to become chatak okay equivalent of paramhans i think that's paramhans versus the other hans it's a very high aspiration for sure but no pressure guys okay you can take your own sweet time <laughs> Okay. Lakshmi, I'm know. getting lost, uh, Nitin ji. Now the concepts of paramhans and uh, hans and all, okay. chatak okay. and all, I, it's really. Uh, I mean, not make it too complicated. So let's <laughs> yeah, not able to the, process it at this point. I think. So yeah, we first have to lost, yeah. see the day we stop finding faults in others. At least we have started becoming hunts. So let's focus on that, and then param hunts will come in due course of time. So for as long as we see faults in others, we dwell upon negative things. We are not yet hunts. So let's focus on becoming hunts. And if you have already become hunts, congratulations. Let's talk about how how can we become paramhans then. Lakshmi ji, you had a question. Yes, Lakshmi ji, Radhe Radhe, please go ahead. It's a little yeah. tough to digest, but my 
understanding is and a simpler way is it like we are uh, we lost you all is a part of god's and uh, hello yeah yeah please go hello is it breaking in between you yeah. yeah now it's okay yes mm-hmm. yeah so we are soul soul is a part of god's energy and uh, so whatever we do we take or we give should be done in a god's consciousness and not get attached and no doership as a simple way. as this correct what i got it perfect you got perfect i think you summed it up very nicely actually you get the okay, okay. okay. okay thank you right thank you. Radhe. 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 yes yes kumar ji you can have the last word please yes radhe radhe nitin ji radhe radhe everyone so when we talk of paramahans i'm thinking probably uh, barbaric uh, son of katotkaj he probably was But one bar- as well barbaric it's uh, babri san babri oh, babri san is it not barbaric barbaric would be like very barbaric guy yeah i was thinking was it the same name or okay babri san it was babri san i don't know why i uh, heard it as or kind of thought of it as barbaric it was he, yeah, of course it sounded very barbaric to me as he well kalyug he would have sued you for you know manhani and... <laughs> but but you know i have such high regards for him so i i don't think he would but anyways so you know i think you know obviously because he would fight for any losing side krishna kind of uh, yes, uh, took the ultimate sacrifice from him uh, made him do the ultimate sacrifice of uh, you know losing his life but he was an um, he was an observer to the war itself and when asked he said all i could see was krishna fighting krishna true very true and and it, thinking deeply about it that's what happened right because it it's all krishna's maya he made it happen he made people fight he he was the one not just the uh, a designer of the war but he was the doer as well right so makes makes so much sense so is he a paramahans gadusham yeah he, he was seeing krishna he couldn't see anything other than krishna that's what he asked him right right so, there's a temple in rajasthan called ghatusham where his head was placed from where he witnessed the war and that's what he saw so yeah he was probably in paramhans avastha that state state he was in where he could only see god in everything yeah what a beautiful thought you know like i when i heard that it was like mm-hmm. you know I, i was thinking yes krishna is the one right he is the one who does everything in the war you know initially our initial thought was hey there is duryodhan here there is someone here but everything so, everything is in that he is residing anams. god is residing in everybody right right but everybody is having their own karmas it's not god god takes control only when they are fully surrendered so they are still doing it but then he could reject that part and only see god that is the avastha he was in that's what essentially what it means it doesn't mean there was no duryodhan there was no shakuni they still had their own baggage So krishna is and, give energy regardless okay your karma is your responsibility that's what he says i'm going to give you energy regardless right we spoke about that concept but paramhans are able to see only that divinity part and reject the rest that so he is exactly the true definition of a paramhans then right yeah okay thank you so pick up pick up on that divinity part of it and reject the rest that is the state they are in and that is why they cannot operate effectively in this world and they have to come down at least to the hans avastha differentiate the divinity and the actual person and then be able to impart the knowledge to them and that is why vedvyas he had to come down to the level of hans to write down the scriptures and do all that stuff so all right are we good then yep we thank you quiz as well miss padma ji real quick um we have to review the quiz as well right for wednesday i have not done that yet so Mm-hmm. just uh, just a last thought um um i asked this question to somebody um another swami about this like okay because i struggled for many years um with the opposite one where um not that i was able to see god but then everybody is god you know um 
every soul is a god so so i went to over and beyond of putting myself in situations where that mindset of like condition mindset of seeing everybody is god everybody is god everybody is god and um and then and then there came a point in life where i was still struggling where my heart was saying okay i i was raised this way that there is god in everybody but then how come there was a conflict and i asked this question like okay how is that how can we come to terms that we accept but at the same time we come through situations in life and people in life where they are god you know there is god in everybody but how come we are not able to deal with that and how come we are not so somebody said it so beautifully that in every human being there is god but but it's not awakened in 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 that the 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 it's not awakened in that particular person or the soul so it's not your mistake that you wanted to see god in everybody but but in that particular individual or that particular situation they they are not at the stage of awakening and neither us neither are us right they are not where the soul is awakened and neither we are not awakened either to the state there where we can only see god in them so on a mid ground platform try your best to see the god in everybody but when the circumstances is really out of your boundaries the spiritual dharma gives you that right to protect yourself and accept that you want to see god in them but at the same time you are it's you have a right to at least move away from that situation or or person or whatever until they are ready to be awakened a little bit and you grow in your own spiritual path so that was a kind of closure answer that somebody uh, another swami gave me where yes you want to see god in everybody but you have to accept that the awakening is not there neither in us and nor in them so the best thing to do in that situation is if you have to safeguard your spiritual merits it's okay by god that you have to wean away yourself from that situation so that you train, you can re- retain your spiritual merit and um continue your spiritual path true that's true that is how we can effectively operate in this world everybody is god is not the correct statement everybody has god it in them is a the correct statement so again they are getting into a dwait philosophy where they say everybody is god so everybody is not god if that was the case then um, we wouldn't have come under maya to begin with right god is all powerful god is maya dhish why would we have imperfections why are we subject to you know birth death old age and disease so we have divinity in us because that is the power house even for our soul that is the real concept everybody has divinity in them but everybody is not god i think that is there is a distinction clear distinction between these two okay i know we are over time so um, maybe we can take the remaining ones or you can put it in your questions in the feedback tracker we can discuss those tomorrow i know we are way over today and um, have some stuff to wrap up as well we will continue this discussion sorry manish and anupurna ji um, you've just run out of time we to can take you tomorrow take your questions tomorrow yeah. yeah or you can put it in the feedback tracker we can pick up pick those up tomorrow we'll talk about guru concept it was a little loaded concept today so but we'll we'll mull over it and continue chewing over it as we go along okay we can do the closing prayers uh, manish ji you can recite that if you want to or anybody mara uh am audible yes 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 okay radhe radhe sarve bhavantu sukhina sarve santu niramaya sarve badrani paschantu ma kashchid dukh bhag bhave om shanti 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 om ram radhe radhe thank you so much manish ji radhe radhe have a wonderful day great rest of your evening and i look forward to seeing you all tomorrow thank you Yeah thank you Nitin ji for such an awesome session thank you everyone for participating have a great day have a great night thank you restful night see you tomorrow thank, thank you everybody good night